You're connected with Content Delaware. So, Lonnie, welcome to the program today. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Tell, tell me about how you got started into uh, working with women and women's issues. Well, I started early on in my career helping people who were managing a variety of problems in their life, whether that was substance abuse or a, a relationship issue or stress level. And early on in my career, one of the things I found is that if I were going to be able to be successful staying in a field where I'm hearing about people's problems and trauma and so forth, that I needed tools to be able to hear and be a witness to people's problems without absorbing their problems and bringing them home with me. And so the very early parts of my career is when I began to notice um, vicarious traumatization and stress levels among therapists and so forth. And I um, really began to commit to figuring out how do you be around stress without becoming it. I know a lot of women uh, tend to want to rescue and help and and as mothers, we you know have that nature to be maternal and, and want to heal people. Uh, and sometimes it's costly to our own psyches and our own mental health. One of the biggest challenges that I see with my female clients and my high compassion male clients is what I call the sponginess, which is the propensity for them to sponge or absorb everyone else's problems and emotions. And we actually know from uh, biochemistry research and um, other forms of current research that women in particular are more likely to experience the emotions of other people in the room. So for example, if anger walks in the room, women rather quickly can match a sense of anger inside themselves. And they'll not only match that emotion, but they'll retain it longer and what I call seep in it and stew in it a long time. And so for women especially, or highly compassionate people, I tell them that it's dangerous to be them. I say, it's great to be you because you're very compassionate and you pay attention. On the other hand, it's a challenge to be you because by 10 o'clock in the morning, if you've encountered an angry person, a fearful person, a frustrated person, if you're not watching your sponge, you will have absorbed it, perhaps without even knowing it, and you might be seeping in it. And so you could be very tired by noon. So some of the strategies, uh, first of all, I, I give people the awareness that um, I always say, you know, how porous are you? How spongy are you? Be, be aware of that and protect your sponge. And what I mean by that is, as you head out the door, um, be aware that your emotions are volatile and could be hijacked. And so if anger walks in the room, you want to sort of step back, watch the anger, and protect your sponge, either with sort of an image of a, a shield. Uh, some people, we talk about the Pope Mobile. Um, so you're there, and you, you're seeing it, and you're saying hello to the person, but you're saying, wow, that's anger, and I don't, I don't choose to go there. So a 14-year-old boy walks in the house, yells at his mother instead of her yelling back, screaming, go to your room. Yes. What should, how should she behave instead? Great. So teenagers, in particular, are extremely emotional, and they're not particularly in control. They haven't learned the skills. Uh, we need to role model the skills and telling a child to be quiet is not coaching them through. So punishing is not coaching and children need development. We all need development, right? And so first of all, as a parent, we want to be aware that teenagers can, can get that way. And when we see a 14-year-old stomping through their house or being emotional, what we want to do is first of all, right, protect your sponge, move back, observe and think. He's on a ride. He's upset. We want to depersonalize that. That's not about me, right? I don't need to be offended by that. I need to help that child through that. And so I don't want to grab that arrow and stab myself with it, right? I want to sort of go, wow, he's a little worked up. Wow, he could use some help finding his manners right there or his cope right there. And so we want to protect ourselves, wait until we're calm, and then offer assistance. And it might sound like this. When you've had a minute to calm down, meet me in the kitchen, and we'll talk about whatever's upsetting you. And so what we're doing is saying, I don't judge you for how you're acting right now, and I'm not even sure you're going to be that way forever. And this is extremely important for teenagers. They're, they try on moods and identities like genes. You know, they go whipping through them. And if we react like that's the new you, oh my gosh, you're out of control, or you're selfish, or you're mean, they're going to hear that. And we don't, we don't want them to think that. We want to think, you're a little bit out of control, you know. Gain your center. Right, you don't want to label them and give them a new identity that's a destructive, self-destructive identity. 
most people believe that other people make them angry or make them crazy. And I remind people, you know, again, they invite us there. Yeah. Right? But it's our choice to go there. And especially with children, especially with teenagers, we want to show them that we don't have to go there. And, and the same thing goes with these other people you were talking about that can fill up your sponge, these toxic people in your lives. Yes. And, and some people have them at work, some people have them at home, some people have them with friendships. How do you find the balance with that? Like mm -hmm. when you don't completely let them go or cut them out of your life, but at the same time you have to limit the amount of energy they suck from you. How, yes. do, you, how do you do that? Yes, so uh, wisdom starts with the proper sort of understanding of things. And so uh, what I always say is let's not let hallmarks tell us what our uh, length of exposure to someone should be. So uh, let's get a good read. Let's get a good diagnostic read on a person. Red light, yellow light, or green light? I talk to kids about this. I talk to adults. I say, is this person red light or yellow light or green light for you? And what I'm saying is, what impact do they have on you? Does this person, green light, they're easy to be around all the time. We like who we are. We're, the, we're who we are meant to be when we're around our green light people. And if we have two or three in our lives at any one time, we're really blessed. Red light people are people that cause us to behave and feel and act in ways or think things that we're not proud of. Um, they get to us, they upset us, we hold on to those feelings. Um, and so red light people are pretty, we would call them toxic. Most people know to avoid red light people. So they don't come to therapy oftentimes for the red light people. It's the yellow light people that cause most people the most challenge because People, first of all, don't think they're supposed to call someone yellow light if they're a family member or a best friend. They also aren't aware. They think logically they're green light, but then all of a sudden they get into trouble. And what I say is, you know, be aware. If someone's yellow light, here's what it means. Manage the situation. Limit your exposure. Know what channels of conversation work for that person and you. Use your feet. If it's starting to be a bit much, excuse yourself and step outside for a little bit. Find a way to tactfully keep that exposure at a level that's just below an allergic outbreak, right? So the allergic <laughs> outbreak, you know, for pollen might be sneezing, for emotions it's going to be crying or hysterical or saying something inappropriate or feeling sort of anxiety or depression. Wow, that's really helpful. Great. Thank you so much. Great.